Kia, small name, but big ambitions. And we'll tell you why this week on Motor in 2004. PSN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. This week we're going to begin with a sort of quiz entitled Name That Car Manufacturer. Now this company has a network of over 3,300 dealers in 190 countries. It has 15 manufacturing and assembly facilities and eight research and development centers and millions of customers. And this is a company that went broke in 1997. Well the company is Kia. It was rescued by Hyundai in 1998, and in 1999, Kia arrived on the shores of Canada. Well, today, it is now the second fastest growing car company in this country, second to Hyundai. Well, this week, we're in Victoria, British Columbia, to check out a vehicle that will take Kia where it has never gone before, the luxury market. And this car is called the Amante. Where they've been is selling a lot of small cars in, in the time that they've been here, which isn't very long, since 1999. And like everybody else, they don't want to sell small cars. They want to sell big cars. They want to sell big, more expensive cars so that the uh, profit margin is a little bit better. But they've got this car now that uh, actually seems to be pretty good value for the money. We're into an, a brand new luxury car with the Amante. We've got value technology built into this car like most people probably, I would say, will be surprised that Kia can build a car like this. Hyundai, of course, purchased Kia out of bankruptcy and Hyundai is a great big force in the automotive world. Huge resources, huge production facilities. So we took some of that expertise from the Hyundai side of the business and applied it to the Kia side of the business. And now Kia is one of the fastest growing car companies in the world today. I think they've done it, like I said, intelligently, uh, because they have a good warranty, five years, uh, which is probably among the best. They have a decent product, and they have good service from what I heard to, from people who have a Kia. So they've, good, they've used a good ingredient to grow up. We've really surprised the industry. We're not just a maker of small cars. We introduced the Sorento last year, the Sorento being our sport utility vehicle. And we are restricted with supply. This vehicle has won awards all over the world. We consistently outsell monthly and year-to-date vehicles that are established, such as the Nissan Pathfinder, Nissan Xterra, Toyota 4Runner, and the Honda Pilot. And they have over 200 dealers in Canada. We currently have 147 dealers. That just tells you really the strength of the product itself. The new Amani is equipped with a 3.5 liter V6. Uh, it's just a little, a little over 200 horsepower. Uh, variable intake uh, manifolds to control nice even power flow and torque. And uh, it's, uh, it's driven through a, a real slick five-speed automatic transmission, all computer controlled. It's for people that are probably buying a base car, like maybe a base Accord or a base Camry or a Buick that want more value, they want a bigger car, they want more safety features, they just want more in a car, but they're not prepared to pay the premium price for some of the premium luxury cars. The hardest work will be to convince people to associate Kia with luxury. Uh, I think that people see Kia as a small, subcompact, uh, cheap but fun car, and now they are graduating, and uh, I think the most a tedious work will be to tell people, well, we have something that is comparable to Audi, BMW, uh, high-end Toyota, or the XJ350 for Hyundai. What Canadians above all want is value for their money, and I think uh, 
That's why companies like Hyundai and Kia and, you know, Volkswagen going back to the 1950s can come in and, and grab a significant share of the market because Canadians don't have as much money to spend on cars as, say, Americans or, or maybe Germans or even the French. And uh, you offer them good value for the money and they'll grab it. You're going after some big competition. Well, we are, but again, when you look at Sorrento and the success we had, we're not afraid of the competition. In fact, they better look in the rearview mirror because we're coming and we're coming fast. I'll bet this guy's glad he bought this car in Canada. More later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, the Mitsubishi Galant has been around for an awfully long time. A way back when, it was sold in Canada as the Dodge 2000 GTX. Back then, however, it got lost in the malaise of mid-sized cars. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the latest version of the Galant. The question is, is this version good enough to break that mold? The newest Galant shares its platform with Mitsubishi's Endeavour mid-sized SUV. As such, it is significantly larger than the previous car, which means more interior room and, more importantly, a wider track and longer wheelbase, a 115mm stretch to be exact. It also supplies a stronger base of operations, as it is two and a half times stiffer in bending and twice as good torsionally when compared to the previous model. You know, the real story behind the Galant is one of two very different cars. Those powered by the 2.4-litre base four-cylinder engine and those powered by the V6. Now, the most obvious difference is the horsepower. The four-banger turns out 160 horsepower. Meanwhile, this oversized 3.8-litre V6, well, it fires 230 horsepower through to the front wheels. <laughs> The difference in the feel, however, goes well beyond the obvious, as it is the torque production that really splits the two. The 4 twists out 157 pounds-feet, the V6 a stout 250 pounds-feet at 4,000 RPM. This massive difference is underscored by the fact that the 6 produces 66 more pounds-feet of torque at 1,500 RPM than the 4 does at its lofty peak. From a standstill, the V6 powers the Galant effortlessly and in a quiet and unflustered manner even when the pedal is matted. In the mid-range, the torque continues to do its thing, allowing slower vehicles to be passed with reassuring ease. By comparison, the force seems frenetic and flustered when forced to work in a similar manner. Both engines are matched to a four-speed automatic. The V6 models benefit from Mitsubishi's Sportronic manumatic mode. You know, the lone drawback with this transmission is that when you do select the manual mode, it will not upshift even as you crash into the rev limiter. Now for the primary driver, hardly a problem. But for somebody that's not familiar with the system, it could be, and it could put the engine at risk. To my mind, a much better solution, force an upshift one RPM before you hit the rev limiter. This accomplishes two things. Nobody can complain about a short shift, and you don't put the engine at risk. No complaints about the brakes, at least in terms of performance. The pedal feel is crisp and the stop suitably short and straight. Sadly though, the decent anti-lock system, which is standard on the V6 models, is not offered on the entry-level cars. In other words, it's another good reason to stick with a 6. You know, the inside of the Galant has been very attractively finished off and you can load it up pretty much any way you want, along with all the usual stuff, power locks, windows, mirrors, cruise control, air conditioning, and keyless entry. You can also add things like a leather interior, a power sunroof, and a wonderful 270 watt audio package that really is the cat's meow. The drawback, there's not a single grab handle in this car. You know, for a car that's got drop down side air curtains, you can perhaps overlook it. In this car, where they're not available, well, I'm sorry, in my book, it's unforgivable. The fully independent front strut and multi-link rear suspensions are nicely tuned as the spring rates and damping characteristics are equally well suited to both controlling body motion and cushioning the ride. 
To accommodate the heavier V6 engine, these models get larger front struts and stiffer springs. The effect this has on the handling is very much appreciated as it helps to mask the 6's nose-heavy design. Through the pylons, understeer was benign and body roll commendably controlled. You know, this latest Galant finally adds some compelling reasons to buy a Mitsubishi. It handles well, the oversized V6 brings plenty of power, and the quality of the fit and finish is there for the world to see. In short, this is a very distant relative to that early Dodge 2000. Our Midas tip of the week concerns engine oil contamination. Now during normal engine operation a certain amount of oil dilution takes place. The oil gets diluted by crankcase vapors and raw fuel that get into the crankcase oil when the engine is cold started in low ambient temperatures. Short trips and low temperatures can cause significant oil dilution from fuel. Also moisture enters the oil every time the engine heat cycles. Heating and cooling uh, produces water vapor and a certain amount of water vapor is a byproduct of combustion. It will enter the oil. These are both reasons why you frequently have to change the engine oil. However, extreme contamination can occur in late model cars when engine gaskets fail and it's something you should keep an eye on. If you've got any combination of a low coolant light coming on periodically, declining coolant level with increasing crankcase oil level and or signs of foreign uh, material underneath the engine oil filler cap you want to get the vehicle into your mechanic and get an oil analysis done and check for the possibility of a failed intake manifold gasket. Here's an example of an intake manifold gasket that's failed. Many late model vehicles use plastic for this gasket. It will fracture and crack and allow coolant to escape the cooling system and enter the crankcase oil. In that case, you've got to address the problem very quickly. That's your Midas tip of the week. We've got a 1967 Pontiac Prigent Lowrider, flamethrowers on the back, dual exhaust, it's got a 350 small block engine, custom stitched flames in the back. This car is so unique because it's unassisted low. We only have about three to maybe four inches ground clearance. And uh, other than that, man, she's just a sweet, fast ride, um, cruising low and slow. The fenders and skirts on this car were made from a delivery truck, uh, mid 50s. What we did was we chopped the hood in half bolted it on, sanded it down, painted it right up, so you can't find fenders like this on any other car. We have a 350 small block. Um, we get about around 300 to maybe 310 horsepower. When I seen this and the work that, the, that they did with the skirts and the flames and every, everything at the time and the care they took to make that, that just called my name and I had to, I had to pick it up. Doesn't matter where you go on this car, she gets looks. expand the Pathfinder name into other vehicles and so we have a full-size SUV called Pathfinder Armada and what it does is really bring all of the imagery of the Pathfinder, the toughness, the ruggedness, the capability, uh, the luxury, the quality that Pathfinder has stood for and adds to its size. This is a full-size SUV. Our train is the 5.6 liter V8 so from a torque standpoint in the Pathfinder Armada this engine has 385 pound-feet of torque which means it has the most torque in the segment. From a capacity standpoint, this new Pathfinder Armada is in a dimension by itself, I guess, in the Nissan lineup. It's eight passenger, it's the V8, it can tow up to 9,000 pounds. So it's a very, very different vehicle than our current Pathfinder. Tell me how many cup holders this vehicle has and why. This vehicle on a fully loaded Ar uh, Pathfinder Armada, you can have up to 14 cup holders. And as I said, it's an active family and we wanted to have enough cup holders for everybody to have at least a couple drinks on the road with them. So it's, it's kind of an alternative to a minivan. So it's minivan type amenities inside with that strong, powerful SUV imagery on the outside. It simply extends our brand into an area that makes absolute sense. Pathfinder buyers 
have been leaving us because we don't sell a full-size uh, SUV and now we have one. So we'll be able to keep people loyal because we'll offer them a vehicle that satisfies their needs. And it, it'll probably have some imp impact even on people who are buying a Nissan for the first time because they'll look at our line and go, you know what, that company sells everything I might ever need, whether I'm starting in a Sentra or starting in an Altima. And you know what, if I want a full-size SUV or a full-size pickup, there's a Nissan there that can satisfy me and we think that's important as well. As we mentioned earlier, the Kia Amante comes with zero options. It comes one way, and that is fully loaded. And that includes things like side airbags, as well as my favorite, and that is the active headrest. Now, if you're hit from behind, the headrest will snap forward to keep your neck from snapping backwards and giving you a very painful whiplash. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, I know the cars themselves are getting safer, but you know, even a real good car can run out of gas or blow a tire. Now, just the other day on the Gardner, the elevated portion of the Gardner Expressway in Toronto, there was a motorist who broke down. I don't know what the nature of the failure was, but anyhow, he got out of the vehicle, was standing beside the vehicle, away from the vehicle. The vehicle got struck by another motorist, and he got hit and thrown over the side of the elevated portion of the expressway. He fell 18 meters down onto the Lakeshore Road somehow survived the fall but he's in rough shape and the police are saying that under circumstances like that the best thing you can do is stay inside the vehicle even if it gets hit that's your best chance of survival now obviously if you're on a limited access roadway where you can't get safely off the traveled portion of the road that's what you want to do stay inside that vehicle get the four ways on if you've got a cell phone and can call for help do that but stay in the vehicle and with the vehicle. Now, if you should break down in a different area where you can safely get the vehicle off the traveled portion of the roadway, there may be some things that you can do. Obviously, if you've blown a tire, you can get that vehicle to a safe location. There's no reason why you or an assistant can't install the spare tire. If you've got the vehicle marked properly, four ways going and in a safe position, put the spare on and then continue your trip at reduced speeds. Now, if you break down away from uh, an urban area, you want to make sure you've got a survival kit in the car, and there's some prepackaged kits that you can get. For example, this is one that Michelin was giving away a couple of years ago when you bought a set of winter tires. There are a lot of prepackaged kits available on the market that have got many of the items that you, that you need to have. One of the most important things you want to have in one of these kits is a blanket. This one's got a couple of uh, thermal uh, blankets as well, foil thermal blankets in here. Uh, it's got a first aid kit as well if, you're, if you've got a minor injury. Uh, there's some booster cables in here if you want to restart a dead vehicle. There's also a, a tow rope in here if you happen to get stuck in the snow and someone comes along with a four-wheel drive vehicle like this pickup truck, they can yank you out. Also, there's a flashlight in here. There's some small pouches of water. Uh, it's important to have water with you and some high energy foods like nuts, for example. If you're a member of the Motor League, you can get good advice from, from the Motor League or from different car clubs as to what items you should have in your emergency preparedness kit to keep in your vehicle. Candles are very important. You've got to have a little metal cup, some candles and matches as well because they can provide heat even if you've got a breakdown where you can't run your engine. If you're going to run the engine, you only want to run it five to ten minutes per hour. Make sure that the tailpipe, tailpipe isn't blocked with snow. And once again, if you get in touch with your motor league, they'll give you an uh, extremely good list of tips that you want to follow in this situation. Keep that in the car and you can follow that if you ever should get broken down. And you know, you may be sitting there thinking, well, I've got a real new vehicle and I don't go too far afield, so I don't really have to worry. But remember, even the newest vehicle can drive over an obstacle and puncture a tire or run out of gas. So you want to be prepared for every eventuality. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. Transport Canada, the guardian of our safety on the highways, you know, they've passed some of the most stringent car test standards anywhere in the world. Our rear bumpers, for example, they've got to withstand an 8 kilometer an hour impact. In the States, it's only 5. Why the difference? And yet, 
you can install some battering ram trailer hitch or some eye gouging bike rack on the back no problem and how about those trucks you know those flatbeds with that razor edge loading dock on the back holy cow run into one of those things it's goodbye head now some people wonder why do we have these crash standards at all I mean if I as a consenting adult would want to drive a little smart car accept a bit more risk of uh, injury in a collision and yet get 60 miles the gallon and be able to park nose first into any sidewalk in the land no chance not gonna happen but one thing I wish they would do is get together on these things I mean surely a crash in Ottawa is not that much different than one in Omaha or Osaka or Osnabrück and yet the car companies spend millions of dollars engineering cars for different markets millions of dollars testing each car against dozens and dozens of different standards and where does that money come out of your pocket why don't they get together in fact the car engineers are telling me it's getting worse not better you, you don't think that the bureaucrats in all these countries are just trying to protect their jobs do you no it couldn't happen the only solution I can see is to make Kenzie supreme ruler of the entire universe then we can get rid of those left lane bandits too I'm Jim Kenzie before we go, a couple of thoughts on the new Kia Amante. From a design point of view, I think it looks a bit like a Mercedes in the front and a town car in the rear, which isn't all that bad. But after a day behind the wheel in and around the Victoria, British Columbia area, I gotta tell you, inside it has the feel and has the amenities of a vehicle worth a lot more than $35,000. Plenty of passenger space and plenty of cargo space in the trunk. As for the V6, I'd like to see a little more power, but believe me, it's ample and very quiet. Graham will have a closer look on a future test drive. But before we go, a little trivia for you. Do you know what Kia stands for? Well, they tell us it's two Chinese characters. Key stands for rising up and A stands for Asia. So roughly translated, Kia stands for rising up out of the east or rising up out of Asia. So there you go. That's it for now. We'll see you next time as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. When I look at a large concentration of cows now, I think renewable fuels. Basically what you're doing is you're uh, extracting the methane from those various processes uh, and then you're using it to, to power vehicles. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas Total Car Care. We do that.